Okay, so PEO, what does it stand for? Okay, Professional Engineers Ontario. Um, there's no of, they're picky about it. Professional Engineers Ontario. And it's a, PEO is, is a body that's created by Ontario legislature. Um, so it's a legalistic body that exists based on regulation. So you can go download and, and read the 40, 50 pages of the PEO Act of Ontario. Um, it's available from their website. This act is, you're going to have to read this one day when you want to become a professional engineer. Right? So PEO is the body that regulates um, the, the title of professional engineer in Ontario. This might be a little bit surprising to you, but the day you graduate here, you cannot call yourself an engineer. Okay? You might be aware of that, you might not, but you are not allowed to use the title of engineer at all in Ontario. Even if you want to start your own company, even if you want to work for an employer, you cannot use the title of engineer until you become a PEng. How do you get that title of PEng is something that that act talks about. So there's a discussion in here about how the committees are formed on that body to grant you a license. There's committees for um, when there's complaints. So if there are engineers and you know that there's an engineer that's doing something that's not legally correct or ethically correct, there's a reporting function and an investigative branch. They have a branch that specifically finds people that call themselves engineers but are not PEO uh, members and they will um, shut you down. So it's, it's a body that exists to regulate the engineering profession. And it's... Um, I guess you might be kind of a little bit surprised that by that, but if you think of doctors, dentists, lawyers, they, you, you can't just walk into a doctor's office and get the treatment from a person calling themselves a doctor unless they have been regulated. Okay? It's, so it's for the same reason that um, unethical behavior might, might spring about. Otherwise, we have this regulatory body that prevents that from happening. Um, now, the body exists, let's look at the second line, they exist to regulate what, they re regulate the practice of professional engineering. Okay, so that's what their, their existence is all about, is to regulate the practice of professional engineering. They have some subsidiary aims. Some subsidiary aims include maintaining standards of knowledge through their members. That's important. We'll talk about that with ethics coming up soon. But so the PEO will publish a newsletter. They'll have monthly meetings that you can attend um, to keep people up to date about the standards in the engineering world. Question mark? So you said that you have to be like with the PEO to work as an engineer? In Ontario. In Ontario. In Ontario. You can't call yourself an engineer in Ontario unless you have a professional engineering license. But isn't that, isn't that separate from the PEO? The PEO grants you the license. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so they regulate the practice of professional engineering, and the way they do that is by issuing these licenses. Now, you don't just get a license. Um, there's several requirements to get a license. But let's just back up a step. What does it mean, the practice of professional engineering? Okay, so the practice of professional engineering is, again, because this is a legalistic um, body, there's the act defines exactly what that is. So at the bottom of your page, when you read legal documents, um, you always have to impute an and in between the clauses, unless otherwise stated. So all three parts need to be present. It's A and B and C will define the practice of professional engineering. So let's read through that right at the bottom. Professional engineering means any act of planning, designing, composing, evaluating, judging in other words, advising, so even advice that you give, reporting, directing, or supervising, so if even managing. 
Okay, well, what are you managing, reporting, composing, evaluating? Part B says the application of engineering principles. Okay, what is that? That's heat transfer, fluid flow, reactor design, pumps, valves, process control systems, hazard and operability studies. Okay, so if you're participating in those, you're um, evaluating a pump and flow diagram. You might be reporting on a heat exchanger. You might be participating in, in any one of these events. So doing any of those, let's look at the final part and part C, and it concerns the welfare of life, health, property, economic interests. That's very, very broad the public welfare or the environment or the management of any such act. So if you're supervising or managing any of these acts. Okay? So let me put it to you this way. If you're working in a company and you're designing a process control loop, are you performing a professional engineering act? Yes. Okay. If you build a cyclone in your garage, are you performing a professional engineering act. Okay. If the cyclone's for someone else, okay, if it's for your personal use and it's not impacting your neighbors and it's not damaging the safeguarding of life, health, property, and economic interests of others, that's not a professional engineering act. If you open a software company that sells software to design heat exchanges and even you make that software freely available to anyone. You write a, a, a macro in Visual Basic or in Python or in MATLAB and you say here, this is written by me, Kevin Dunn, engineer, can I do that? Not in Ontario unless I'm a licensed PNG. Okay? So, Pretty much most activities that you'll be involved in are considered professional engineering acts and require this license. Yes? So when people go on co-op, they're not engineers yet, but they have to do this. What's the balance? Okay. So you're graduating, you go work in a company, you're not a professional engineer. You go on a co-op term, you're not a professional engineer, and you're doing this work. How is that allowed? working under an engineer, and they're taking responsibility for your work. Yeah. This is for us to ask you, somebody should just always just work under an engineer for the rest of his or her life? Yes. Don't you don't have to become a, P a professional engineer. Okay. No one's telling you you have to, but then you have to work with someone who's going to take responsibility for your work. Okay. So, in a company, there will be two or three or more people that are professional engineers, and they're the ones that take ultimate responsibility for the corporation's work. Okay. Does teaching chemical engineering require a PNG? No. <laughs> Does it concern the safeguarding of life, health, property, economic interest, public welfare? Okay. <laughs> So ask the other faculty what they think about that. Um, yeah, so I became a PNG back in February, but um, I'm teaching this because we need to be teaching this. And the reason is, one of the things that happens when you graduate is that you can apply for a PNG in four years. Okay, so let's go back to the requirements for a PNG. You need to be 18 years of age. That's easy. We meet that criteria. Be of good character. Um, I'm sure most of you are. <laughs> okay, so the way they figure that out is they, you have to give three references. Two of your referees have to be professional engineers already. The one referee uh, doesn't have to be. Uh, one of the referees must be your, your immediate boss. Um, successfully complete, complete the PPE, the professional practice exam. What you'll do there is you'll read these two books, self-directed learning. You'll learn about engineering, law, and the professional engineer. You'll learn about ethics and you will write a three-hour exam. And that's it. That's the PPE. Okay. You need to then, step four, demonstrate 48 months of verifiable experience 
Does that experience have to be in Canada? No. Only 12 months of it has to be in Canada. So three years might be outside of the country if you're an immigrant or working for a company outside of Canada under a licensed professional engineer. Does your co-op experience count? Yeah. Yes, up to one year, a maximum of 12 months counts. Okay, so you've already got some fraction of that out of the way if you've done co-op. And then the last is you need an undergraduate degree from a university that's approved by the CEAB. Okay, and that's the key requirement. A university re accredited by the CEAB, CEAB, Canadian Engineering Accreditation Board, has accredited the program you're taking. So when you graduate, the PEO knows that this program is accredited, so you don't have to write any other exams other than that law exam, that three-hour exam. If you graduated from a university that's not CEAB accredited, you would need to write all sorts of exams that test your knowledge of reactor design, thermodynamics, fluid flow. These are difficult exams, and you'll see the people writing these exams next week in JHE 342, Monday to Friday. These immigrants to Canada is usually what they are, are coming to write those exams here at the university. And they're set by the PEO to test their knowledge. If they pass those exams, then they're considered to have the knowledge of what you guys have graduating from McMaster. So the fact that our program is accredited, and we're, we're going through an accreditation cycle next year. In August, we're, Cambridge is going to be re-accredited. Um, once we get that accreditation, we have it for six years, and every six years we get reviewed to make sure we're teaching you well and up to the standards that they're looking for. Okay? So it's important that you graduate from an accredited university. I did not graduate from a Canadian university, but my university I graduated from was accredited. So again, I didn't have to write those exams either. University of Cape Town was accredited. Okay, so it doesn't have to be a Canadian university, just a university that's recognized to have high levels of standards so if you meet those five requirements, you're good to go for a PNG as long as you pay them the money. Now, once you get that license, then you can call yourself an engineer and you can practice professional engineering in the province. Can you go practice professional engineering in Alberta? They have their own. They'll recognize the Ontario license, but you have to apply for that recognition. You can't just go to Alberta and say, I'm a professional engineer in Ontario and just start working there. Yeah, you don't have to write the Alberta exam. Yeah. Now, it's not so easy going to the United States. Each, each state in the United States has their own um, process as well. And some are really difficult, and some don't waive the exams. It could be that Cambridge at McMaster loses their accreditation. Are there any schools that you know of that are accredited? <laughs> nope. Most engineering schools, I, I, I don't know of any engineering schools that are not accredited. Yeah. Just as it started, yeah. Okay, so getting your. Just a sec. Getting your degree from Mac, getting your iron ring, that doesn't mean anything. Having an iron ring on your finger does not mean that you're an engineer. It means that you paid for this degree. That's all it means. Okay? So you're not a professional engineer until you have your PNG. No, so as long as you graduate from a university that, when, when, a, when a, uh, a university is accredited, it's accredited for a certain block of time. So if you graduated from that block of time, you're considered accredited. It might be that the standards in that university changed or decreased after you left, and they'll lose their accreditation. So then subsequent students have to write those exams. Okay? Yes, Mark? What kind of degree do you have to have? Like you can't take any degree, like, like a health science degree, and then write the 
No, no, you can't. You're right. You can't have a business degree and become apply to for a professional engineering designation. It has to be an engineering degree from a, a accredited university. So, I mean, what if you wanted to like that, like say you do like? You can't. Yeah. So the cri criteria number five is an undergraduate degree in engineering from a CAB accredited university. Okay. So you 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 can't get that. Okay. So. So let's, uh, the middle part is from their PO website, only individuals that hold that PNG license can use the word professional engineer in their job title. Okay, so that's, that's about the extent of what I want to talk about regarding professional engineering. Any further questions on that? Okay, yes, Helen. What does the exam cover? The exam is um, four questions related to law and four questions related to ethics. Okay, and the law cases are simply about contracts and tenders and the rights and obligations of contract law. If you've taken any contract law courses here at the university, you'll find it straightforward. The ethics courses always present an ethical case study and ask you to resolve it, and we'll I'll give examples of that in a minute. Helen, um, does it matter like the time period based on when you do the four years? Say you work for Uh, okay, good question. Does the time period matter? Like you do your four years, you go and maybe do something else and then come back. I believe it does not. I, have, I read it through it again. That question keeps coming up. I couldn't find any evidence about that, but I'm, I might be wrong. Okay. Uh, yes, you can lose your license. The license can be revoked if you are reported and found um, not in compliance with some criteria that we'll talk about next week. Yeah. So that four years, it has to be in Ontario, correct? Three years are, can be anywhere one year in Ontario okay. under professional license. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so let's... Um, not, not all of Canada has to be in Ontario. Let me just make sure. 12 months at a... Sorry, my mistake. 12 months in a Canadian jurisdiction. 48 months of total experience required. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so under Canadian jurisdiction, yeah. No, I mean, like, like I know, like, Alberta has, like, APEGA, which is, yeah. yeah, are they, like, pretty much the same? Okay, good question. Are the other accreditation uh, bodies uh, pretty much the same? Yes, they are. To, to the large extent, um, you'll find very little difference between the different provinces in Canada. Okay, so what I want you to uh, think about next um, is we want to talk a little bit about ethics. And when we talk about ethics, ethics are often presented as the sort of idea that there's this, this situation happening and you have to pick a, a course of action. And I mean, the most, you often hear this example that's used you're riding in a bus and you're coming down the mountain and your brakes are failing and there's a group of young kids or there's this group of seniors. Okay. Is that an ethical dilemma? No, that's a bullshit case study. Okay. Like why are you even driving a bus? And why are your brakes failing? Why didn't you check that before you got into the bus? <laughs> and why is the choice only between the kids and the grannies? <laughs> right? There's, it's never, never like that. Right? Real life is not so dichotomous. So when we talk about ethics next week, I want you to think a little bit about there's a far richer environment that you deal in. When you, just a second, when you're facing an ethical dilemma, there's personality differences. There's the boss that you hate. There's your friend that you like. There's office politics. There's money. Okay? There's the idea that you want to get promoted and be successful in the company you're working with. Right? These things all play into our decisions. So to present it as such dichotomous case studies makes no sense and does a disservice to, to you. So uh, in class on Monday, we'll talk a little bit about some ethical case studies. Right. Like, is it ethical for your boss to ask you to make the pressure vessel 
a little thinner to save money? Is it ethical to sign off on paperwork and say that the emissions from your plant are below the limits when you really haven't done thorough test work? Right? I can present all manner of case studies to you with very little snippets like that, but that's not giving full context. There's always more to the story. Okay, so think about that idea. Why are you driving down the mountain? Why are your brakes failing? We can always back out the case study and, and look a little bit more carefully at it. So we'll talk about that on Monday. Oh, just one other thing.